everyone. Welcome to our service of worship for May the 2nd for Kingston Road United Church. I am still in Nova Scotia. Um, it's quite unbelievable to me, but um, it seems that the safest and most practical thing to do at this point is to stay put. Um, some of you will know that Nova Scotia is now in a lockdown because our numbers have um, have increased substantially in the last couple of weeks. And so we're in a two week lockdown and uh, uh, nobody in or out of the province or um, gatherings are, are with other households are forbidden. Um, I have been vaccinated, so that's a good thing. Um, so, uh, time will tell. I have uh, learned over this past year not to plan too far in advance. Uh, I hope that you all are keeping safe and well. I know things are, are very distressing in Ontario and um, I'm in constant contact with uh, the leadership at KRU and, uh, and with other staff people. So. Um, so again, my, my thoughts, my prayers uh, are, are with all of you in, uh, in these very turbulent times. And um, all we can do is just kind of hang on and go uh, one day at a time. Uh, so I hope that this worship service will offer some um, uh, a little space for whatever it is that you need, whether some meditative time, some quiet time or some uh, perhaps um, some, um, some lovely music, some um, maybe even uh, words of inspiration. So um, please feel welcome, whatever you bring to this time. I will acknowledge the land and also to say that uh, I am uh, in uh, Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral territory of the uh, Mi'kmaq. And uh, Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississauga, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace and friendship and respect. So let's just take a moment to prepare ourselves for worship. Also, just to uh, um, to say, I, I forgot to uh, to say that we resume last week. We didn't have friendship time because we were having our annual meeting. So, um, friendship time resumes tomorrow at eleven forty-five. Please join us. It's a Zoom call, and uh, it's a time of conversation, informal check-in, and um, many people um, drop in uh, over the course of um, 
of the time, whether you can stay for 10 minutes or 45 minutes. It's just always great to see people. And if you have a candle that you um, that you want to light, now would be the time to do it. We light this candle as a as a sign of Christ in our midst, the light of Christ that shines in us and through us and in the world. Holy risen one, we come as we are. We come from different places. We share one love, accept all that we bring to you today, accept our worship, let us pray. Holy mystery, your spirit moves wild and gentle, solid and fluid, speaking and silent, challenging and affirming, breaking and mending. Sometimes we can be inflexible, clinging to tradition, resisting change, yearning for security, rejecting risk, routed in routine. We seek help to let go of that which makes us hesitant, fearful, reluctant. May our praise today sing a new song. May we find harmony in sacred presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now imagine that this light, this light which is in us and through us and in the world, that that light of Christ that is in you is extending out to those that are close to you. To, maybe it's extending out beyond your walls, to the neighborhood, to the wider community, to the church, and watch it spread like the rising sun as it expands all around the world. And let this be our peace. Amen. And friends, the peace of Christ is with you. Amen. Our opening hymn is in more voices. It's number 12, Come Touch Our Hearts. Come touch our hearts that we may know blazing fire, love strong enough to overturn injustice, to seek a world more gracious, come touch and bless our hearts. Come touch our souls that we may know and love you, your quiet presence all our fears dispel. Create a space for spirit to grow in us. Let life and beauty fill us. Come touch and bless our souls. Come touch our minds and teach us how to reason. Set free our thoughts to wander and to dream. Help us to in the moments we are fragile, and in our weakness your great strength reveal, that we may rise to follow and to serve, steady now our nerve, come touch and bless our way. This is a story written by Ralph Milton in his Lectionary Story Bible, 
and it's about Cornelius getting baptized. Peter wasn't sure if it was a dream or not. How could it have been a dream? He said, I was wide awake. It seemed so real. I saw a big cloth coming down out of the sky, Peter told his friends. And in the cloth were some of the animals we Jewish people aren't allowed to eat. Then Peter heard a voice in his head, Peter, said the voice, take these animals, cook them and eat them. But I can't, said Peter. He said it out loud, even though there was nobody else with him to hear it. I can't hear the, I can't eat those things. Jewish people don't eat those kinds of animals. They are unclean. Wrong, said the voice in Peter's head. Don't say they are unclean. God made them, and so they are clean. This happened three times. Each time the clock came down, and each time Peter heard the same words, and each time he said the same words back. This must be God trying to tell me something, Peter thought. Just then there was a loud knock on the door. Is your name Peter? said the man at the door. Peter nodded. I have a message for you from Cornelius. Cornelius would like you to come see him. And this is the picture of the animals. Peter looked very surprised. Cornelius is a Roman soldier, he thought. He isn't Jewish. I shouldn't go to his house. Then Peter remembered the sheet with the animals in it. God made Cornelius just like God made me. I'm not unclean, so Cornelius isn't unclean either. I will go visit him. Cornelius was glad when Peter came to his house. Thank you for coming, he said to Peter. I've invited all my friends and family so they can hear you tell us about your friend Jesus. Will you do that? Of course, said Peter. Cornelius had a big house and a lot of people were there. Peter stood on a box so everyone could see and hear him. My friends, he said, something happened to me that taught me an important new idea. I learned that God doesn't have any favorites. God loves everybody, not just the Jewish people, but everybody in the whole world. Then Peter told them the story of Jesus. He told them the stories of how Jesus taught people about God and how to live in God's way. How Jesus had made sick people feel better. Then something terrible happened, said Peter. Or at least it seemed terrible at first. Some of the rulers thought Jesus was trying to get an army and fight them. So they killed him. But here's the best part of the story, said Peter. We all thought Jesus was dead, but Mary of Magdala and the other women went to the place where Jesus' dead body was supposed to be, and it was gone. And then they saw Jesus alive again, but in a new way. The other friends of Jesus also saw him. We saw him. Jesus is alive, not alive in his body. Jesus is alive in our hearts. All the people in Cornelius's house were so happy to hear that. Some of them started to sing, others started dancing. All of them were excited. Peter looked at them and smiled. I think God's spirit is in your hearts right now. Yes, that's right, said Cornelius. Just look at us, see how happy we are. This is wonderful, said Peter. The spirit of God is in your hearts, even though you are not Jewish. That's what my dream was about. Would you like to be baptized? Oh, yes, please, said Cornelius and all the people in his house. Yes, please. So they all walked down to the river and Cornelius and all his family and friends were held under the water for just a moment and they lifted up again. I feel clean and new inside, said Cornelius. I feel the spirit of God in my heart. I'm going to live in God's way.
hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Let us pray. We open now to sacred mystery, to the Holy One, infinitely greater than words can express, whose love for us and for all creation exceeds our capacity to imagine. Amen. Our scripture today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 15, verses 1 to 12. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
I've been visited this week by voices and messages. Maybe you might say it's time for a vacation. And that may be true. But when all the messages and pieces of information that I encounter within a short framework all point to a similar theme, then I need to pay attention. It started with watching the lecture that Reverend Michael Blair, General Secretary of the United Church of Canada delivered at Emmanuel College a number of weeks ago. And the title of Michael's lecture was Becoming the Beloved Community. Is there a future for the church? Michael first introduced himself as a learner, a listener, and a seeker of justice. He challenged his listeners, probably mostly church folks, to move from a language of membership and adherence to one of discipleship. He said that when we focus on membership instead of discipleship, we lose sight of mission and ministry. And he asked the question, what does it mean to be disciples on the way, to be followers of Jesus? And he then retold a wonderful story from a decades old United Church resource called Mending the World. And the story came from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. And it goes like this. When God, the Holy One, gets up in the morning, God gathers the angels of heaven around and asks, asks the simple question, where does my creation need mending today? And then Rab Rabbi Heschel would continue, theology consists of worrying about what God worries about when God gets up in the morning. Michael went on to talk about two theological themes, the beloved community and the call to discipleship. On Wednesday evening this past week, the anti-racism discussion group had a deep and insightful conversation about Michael's lecture, what stood out for them and possible implications for our own faith community. And we expressed a hunger to learn more about beloved community and also about discipleship, what it means to be followers of Jesus. On Friday, I came across a very recently recorded webinar from the Canadian Council of Churches called A Seat at the Table, Journeying Towards Beloved Community. It was a wonderful workshop with lots of ideas and practical suggestions from folks already doing some of the hard work of transforming communities. At the beginning, a number of quotes were offered in response to the question, what is beloved community? And here's just a few. Beloved community is, a formed, is formed not by the eradication of difference, but by its affirmation by each of us claiming the identities and cultural legacies that shape who we are and how we live the world. And here's one from Martin Luther King Jr. Our goal is to create a beloved community and this will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. And from Parker Palmer, community is that place where the person you least want to live with always lives. And when that person moves away, someone else arises to take his or her place. And then a friend posted this quote from spiritual author and activist, Jim Palmer. That moment when it hits you that your life won't last forever and you think about the people you love deeply and thinking about it aches. And you don't know if it's because sometimes you love people so much it hurts or because you wonder if you missed opportunities to love them or could have loved them better. And you are reminded once again that there is nothing more important than love. The greatest single need and desire of humankind is love. 
To love is the greatest power and freedom we possess. Every thought, word, and action motivated by love changes the world. Love is the highest expression of what it means to be human. The chief characteristic of true enlightenment is love. The best I know to say is, don't leave love left undone. There may be things you don't accomplish, attain, or achieve in this world, but you don't, but don't let shrinking back from love be one of them. If you're fortunate, you discover that love is the only thing that really matters. Love heals everything and love is all there is. On your way out of this world, you look back and see it was always about that. It was always about love. And again, that was from Jim Palmer from a book called Notes from Over the Edge. And so what am I to do? with these messages about becoming a beloved community in light of our biblical reading this week. A story about the early church squabbling over rules and practices. Is the church of 2021 any different today? One commentator remarked that this passage represents a typical church meeting. Reports are shared, scripture is read, theology is discussed, experience is shared, and then perhaps a decision is made. Did some of you have been part of church meetings recognize that? I'm reminded of the Ethiopian eunuch's question from last week, what is to prevent me? from being baptized and Philip's resounding answer, nothing. However, another commentator mentioned that there were inevitably a number of folks in the early church who might not have been too happy with Philip's rogue baptism that day. To understand today's passage, the one that I read out, which is often called the council at Jerusalem, it requires a little bit of context. There is still no official Christian church at the time of our story. The followers of Jesus were still mostly Jewish people, and there had been a lot of change. You will recall Jesus challenging many of their assumptions and practices when they got in the way of helping their neighbors and taking care of the marginalized folks in their midst, eating with people previously thought to be unclean, touching people previously thought to be unclean. And some of the church leaders are saying, enough already. We've had too much change. To welcome uncircumcised people, which is kind of a code or shorthand for saying those who don't follow the law of Moses, to welcome those people without them taking up our laws and practices that are so important to us is just not acceptable. It was important for Jewish people to hold to their to laws and customs as an occupied nation to prevent from being absorbed into the pagan Roman Empire. And then Peter speaks and he retells the experience that he had with Cornelius and his family and his famous dream, the story that Alana read today. Now Cornelius is a centurion in the Roman army. A centurion, the highest an enlisted man could aspire to in the Roman army, was in charge of a hundred foot soldiers. They've been called the backbone of the Roman army, and they were known to be well traveled, knowledgeable, and well paid. And we're told that Cornelius is a devout man who feared God, giving alms to the poor and praying constantly. And although he is not Jewish, he seems closely connected to Judaism. Cornelius has a dream, a vision of an angel, a messenger from God, and he is told to send some of his men to bring Peter to him. As the men set out to bring Peter to Cornelius, Peter is having his own vision. He falls into a trance and sees a sheet full of what the Jewish faith believes are unclean animals, according to the laws laid out in the book of Leviticus. And because of this dream that Peter has, 
he understands that he's supposed to go to Cornelius's house and end up and ends up baptizing the whole family. So Peter says to the group in Jerusalem about this experience that he's had with Cornelius, God has told me never to call anyone unclean. Essentially, Peter is saying to the group, you are saying that God is wrong if you don't accept this new way. Many have referred to this story as the conversion of Cornelius and his household. In fact, this story is more about Peter's conversion as he becomes more deeply aware of what it really means to follow Jesus. Peter had to come to the understanding that God was already active in Cornelius' life. Again, it's kind of like last week's story about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, who converted who. Commentator Eric Barreto says that what we learn from the story about Cornelius and Peter is that God wants a church that is teeming with diversity. The communities that God wants to draw together are both wildly diverse and wild, widely inclusive. He says that God welcomes peoples of the world in the midst of, not despite their ethnic particularities. And we hear also in the story about the Council of Jerusalem from Paul and Barnabas, who speak of the signs and wonders that they've witnessed as they have traveled amongst the Gentiles. In one of the resources for today, it talked about how often it is the side issues that become the focus of conflict because the group isn't quite ready to engage with the real issue. And it says in many ways, it's a safety measure, a sign that you aren't quite ready to engage with the real issues. The real issues are only uncovered after a length of time and difficulty. The side issues in this case, were circumcision as well as food issues and who people could eat with. The main issue was what place the law that was given to the Jews had on this emerging church and, the, and thus salvation. And so as the church evolves today, the underlying questions are not always the ones that are being outwardly asked. We are busy asking about planning and process and structures rather than what is the nature of the church and what is the church called to do in the world? When you explore answers to that question, ways can be built that enable us to evolve the church to fit its calling best. One of the facilitators of the Canadian Council of Churches session, Diana Hope, defined what she called a just intercultural community. And she defined it this way. In just intercultural community, each member of the community is able to be fully themselves in their unique identity and each culture is fully able to express itself. At the same time, members of the community are willing to be shaped by other members and poverty, hunger, homelessness, racism and other forms of discrimination are not tolerated but are intentionally addressed with a goal to elimination. I think that's an important piece that members of the community are willing to be shaped by other members, other members from different cultures and backgrounds. And Adele Halliday from the United Church of Canada, who was also one of the facilitators at that session said that said that becoming a beloved community takes intention and action. Michael Blair, drawing on the writings of Martin Luther King Jr. says that a beloved community is always a community of justice. Injustice somewhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Up until now, the approach of the white church has not cost anything. Whereas in a beloved community, everyone pays a cost. And I wonder if that has something to do with focusing on the side issues so that the harder questions of cost and real change are avoided in some of the conflicts presently going on in the church. 
Of course, there are some concrete ideas and strategies that are put forward by Michael and also in the Canadian Council of Churches webinar. So uh, stay tuned because I'm not finished with this discussion. I too am a listener, a learner, and a seeker of justice. I hope you are too. What do you think God is worried about today? Amen. We hold in prayer today, Barbara Livesey, Keith Bolton, Sean Harvey, Bill Oxenham, Rob Williams, Cheryl Fenn, Karen Hager, Owen Martin, and Randy Rorabek. Let us pray. Holy One, Open the eyes of your church that she might lead the way to a new way of living in which all are equally valued, in which the language spoken is one all may understand, in which the call to serve is one on which all may play a part. Let us lay down the things which divide and dull our relationships and the things that cause conflict of little worth. Let us lay down the issues that are more about us than about the love of God. Let us lay down the words that might have been said that may have hurt Let us lay down grudges we might cling to from long ago. Let us lay down our fear of the future. A fear that the future may be uncomfortable and unfamiliar.
Let us lay down all that does not bring life. We pray for all those we have named and for those around the world and in our midst who are suffering this day, suffering from grief, from bereavement, from fear, from lack of community. from abuse, we pause now to name them in the silence of our hearts. We gather all these prayers in the name of the one who taught his community, our creator who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so, folks, let us leave the fear, let us leave the anger, let us leave the hurt, let us leave the pain, let us leave it all and go in peace. And may the forgiveness of God and the teachings of Christ and the presence of the Spirit bring peace to you and joy to your hearts this day and every day. Amen. And our closing hymn is number 639 in Voices United. One more step along the road we go. <laughs>